I will not be focusing as much tonight on climate because really I think folks that are thinking about how do you go from the clinical side and begin to think about a pop, basically when you do public health, you have a patient that has in the United States, 340 million cells rather than and in California, about 40 million cells. And it's in some ways, it's similar thinking. And in fact, when I hired physicians when I was in the state and also when I was at CDC, I insisted they continue with their clinical skills because clinical care and population care, we need each other. But I'm also going to talk about my personal journey. And if you remind me at the end, I'll explain what an honorary AIA and an honorary FASLA is. But um, the especially for big challenges, we are going to really need to partner the health community, the medical care community, and the other. The reason I put the yin-yang figure is, and I've thought about this and meditated on it a lot, is how without that connection, we become uh, lost. And, and it, you know, in some traditions, it's male-female, and some it's right brain, left brain. It's uh, in the literary tradition, it's romanticism and classicism. But the dynamism, the dialectic is so important as we think forward. I'd like to um, dedicate my talk to really people that have shown enormous bravery and the firefighters, including, you know, there are about 14,000 of them out there and a good number of prisoners that were doing release time for very small amounts of money uh, to do that. And I was very glad to hear that uh, they are now being enabled if they once they serve whatever they have to serve to be hired into fire departments. So that'll be very important. Uh, I was one of the opening speakers at that National Academy of Medicine meeting, and we had about 8,000 people in attendance, which is um, unprecedented in the history of the National Academy. And I was gratified because half of it was on COVID. We had Tony Fauci himself that received the highest award ever given in a beautiful encomium speech. Uh, it was lovely because he got the award on the same day. The president told him he was a loser and um, he was stupid. So um, you can figure that one out on your own. I started out my talk by reflecting that on September 8th, uh, it turns out September was the hottest day globally in world history. Um, getting up, and I thought I had awakened on Mars, and many of our listeners would know exactly what I mean. Um, at that point, I regretted that with the smoke overhead and the density, uh, friends of mine that have solar panels said they were down to 5% energy collection from the panels compared to what you'd expect on a beautiful California day. Of, and um, I, I also regretted not having purchased um, some home air filters. I was thinking about doing it for COVID, but then I realized I, maybe this ought to be standard for all Americans, or at least all Californians, because I think the era of fires is long from over and the COVID era is not going to end anytime fast. I told the story about then, um, I tell you, the dog was out of sorts. We, everybody was very upset and anxious about the sun disappearing. And I called my son, who's a school teacher, and they have a new baby, a month old, and suddenly realized that my son, age 36, had never lived in a colder than average year, average being the last 150 years. And my new granddaughter, a month old, had lived in the hottest year in uh, American history. I'm sorry, in the hottest month in American history, September. And so it really, this is very present. So I go back to um, when I was very little, and I was born a bit of a while after uh, December 7th, but this was a transformative day in American history. And um, of course, after Pearl Harbor, uh, Franklin Roosevelt went to the Congress and U.S. declared war on Japan and within hours Germany declared war on the United States as well. And people don't know the story, but in the next few days, Roosevelt called in the heads of GM, Ford, the steel industries. He said, this is our major focus. We are not going to think about anything else but this war. And the head of GM said, well, sir, you know, um, we'll try and make plenty of Jeeps for you or and I guess Chrysler made the Jeeps, and Ford was making air, some aircraft. He said, no, no, you're stopping everything else. You are going to do nothing but the war effort. The point of that story a little bit is that I think for climate change, we are going to need that same level of complete commitment. 
Well, also, also around December 9th, 41 or 10th, uh, this young man, he was probably about 19 or 20, uh, went down to the recruiting station, volunteered for the Air Force, and was um, made a pilot. And over time, finally was brought in about a, six or eight months later, crashed once uh, during that training. He was hospitalized for about three weeks, couldn't wait to get back in the aircraft, and eventually was uh, transferred over to the South Pacific. And in the lower right picture, he's in a P-51 um, flying over Iwo Jima. It was a pretty fraught time. About half his squadron died. Um, a good number of his fellow pilots were killed in the barracks while well, they were asleep one night because the Japanese were hiding in the caves and would come out and kill uh, pl places that weren't being adequately guarded. Um, before he'd gone over, he married um, his beautiful high school sweetheart and see in the top picture. And uh, off he went and bit over nine months later, around nine months later, his first child was born. And you can see that first child with his two siblings in this picture. Um, he came back from the war um, in 46. They had two more babies right away, uh, classic Irish triplets. At age 27, he was running the airport in Portland, Maine. And uh, one day, this guy could do 100 push-ups at a time. He developed trouble breathing. And within about 12 hours, he was in the hospital, and about 12 hours later, he died of polio, leaving my mother, age 27 also, with three little babies. Uh, the grandparents came up from New Jersey and collected all of us and took us back to New Jersey, and I lived with, and with my brothers with uh, the two sets of grandparents in the Newark area, and uh, my mother remarried and had four more children, but it was a tough haul, and when back in those days, you had $10,000 of insurance, it was a lot of insurance, but it didn't go very far with three kids, and there was really no child care uh, settings um, to speak of, so the grandparents were very important, but then my grandfather, Jackson, my dad's father, he had had, had diphtheria as a child and had um, heart disease, and he eventually died in 1951, so... It was um, a very tough stretch, and I have to tell you, after that experience, if someone says to me, I don't believe in immunization, and I've got two direct lineage Y chromosomes that died of polio and diphtheria, um, I, will, I get pretty upset. Um, I became very close to my mother over that period of time. You can imagine she, she was deeply depressed, and she spent a lot of time talking to me, and that was both a gift and a burden, as some of you can guess. Uh, she had grown up in East Orange, New Jersey. And in this factory in East Orange, young women who had been taught to paint radium dials, including for aircraft um, and for watches and such things, were taught to do it using the technique that was used to paint fine china, which is where you lick a very fine, uh, I think it's a, a pig hair brush, but they were licking the radium constantly. And within a short time, and my mother recalls this, the most frightening thing she ever saw was women walking around town with bandanas uh, below their nose because their lower jaws had rotted off. And even now in East Orange, if you have a Geiger counter you, and you walk through the cemetery and you walk over those graves, your Geiger counter will go off. So the point of that story is that um, the reality of environment and things that happen in the workplace, the environment, were, was very real to us. This is a very industrial state. We called it the Garden State, but um, industry had replaced a lot of its standard oil of New Jersey being one of the biggest ones. I had, uh, because of this, had decided that uh, I would go and be a Jesuit seminarian and after a very tough Catholic high school, um, entered the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit novitiate, which was both the richest two years of my life in the sense of I learned so much and the message of your job is service. This is not about you. It's about a much bigger world than you. Really got into me in the Catholic training. I went back. I left because um, seminary life didn't meet all the young man's needs. And uh, I went to finish a Jesuit college. In fact, I was a couple years behind Tony Fauci, um, who was also had that same track, and Jerry Brown. Uh, at that time, and over time, I, was, uh, I applied for medical school. And uh, 
um, started medical school in July of 1969. And I want to just recognize that Dacey Mitchell, Dr. Dacey Mitchell was the person who interviewed me for UCSF. And I thank her for the fact that I was able to get into UCSF. Back then, the day of the moonwalk, there were three and a half billion people in the in the world. And the climate, the CO2 level was 324 parts per million. I'll show that later on, but you'll see the significance when I show it to you. You can imagine coming from Newark. Um, we lived in Newark until I was about 11. Then we moved to Nutley, New Jersey, but both of them on Hud up the Passaic River. And the significance of that is the Passaic River was the longest Superfund site in the United States. Uh, it, is where, it was where Patterson Falls were, but it's also where Diamond Shamrock was dumping in the byproducts of their production of Agent Orange. Uh, the creek coming through town, I'm not making this up, ran through the property of Poff and LaRoche. And one of the recreations for kids was to go down and see who could capture the most deformed tad tadpoles of all. So the idea that pollution and the bad environments could hurt people was in a New Jersey person's DNA. Um, I was so happy to be in San Francisco, be able to go out for a run at lunch and go down to the beach and come back and the bicycling and over to Tam on a bike. And it was like heaven to me. And I, I wonderfully enjoyed my time there. I think I probably went into pediatrics and I love clinical pediatrics. Um, during the time I, I did my pediatrics at UCSF as well, but I only did two years uh, and then went somewhere else. I'll tell you about that in a minute and then came back after two more years. This is a day shortly before I went off to CDC and we were discharging two twins that had uh, were born very, about 28 weeks. And uh, you become very close to these families and children over a couple of months. And it was a, both a sad day and a happy day. They were going home with the mom. The sad day was the mom was 19 years old and was completely going to be overwhelmed with what she was um, facing. And Pediatrics, honestly, and I say this humbly, it can be very routine or it can be just heartbreaking. And it's uh, there are a lot of things about the specialty that's very, very hard. UCSF has a magnificent um, nursery. You've all heard of CPAP. Well, it was in invented for babies with prematurity. We were saving 27 weekers 40 years ago with the most primitive machines, blood gas measuring machines and everything else you can imagine. But I remember one day when uh, two little girls came in. It was actually over the course of a week. Three little girls came in with gastroschisis. And the the folklore in pediatrics, by the way, is they're, they're always beautiful babies. And one of the nurses said to Dr. Julian Hoffman, who was one of the attendings, do you think it could be the pesticides that they're using out in the Central Valley? They were, well, these kids were from the Fresno area, the children. And he said, no, it's a Poisson distribution. You, you know, rare things um, occur randomly, but sometimes they can cluster. But finding cause and effect kind of from this kind of event is extraordinarily rare. A few weeks later, we had a cluster of babies with spina bifida. And uh, again, the answer was, oh, it's just random clustering. But being the Jersey guy, this one stuck in my head like, uh oh, maybe there's something really out there. Could it be from the pesticides? California uses immense amount of chemicals. Um, about half of all the pesticides um, in the United States. And um, I, uh, it's stuck in my back of my mind. I had owed time to the, to the, for the, you know, for the draft, frankly, because of the uh, Vietnam era and was lucky enough to go to CDC in 1975 and to join the Epidemic Intelligence Service. And back then, the security was almost laughable. You could walk in the front door at two in the evening, two at night, and the guard would nod at you, but nobody really said anything. It was uh, an amazing place, a lot of bright people. And um, I'll tell a side story when I was there because it relates to the dreadful um, position CDC has been in for the last eight months. Uh, when around that time, a different RNA virus, namely Ebola, had emerged in Central Africa, and it was ver universally lethal. And they asked, CDC directors asked, okay, we need volunteers to go to Africa. And seven people volunteered, and they were on the plane within 12 hours going there. And that was the tradition of CDC. You went, when there was a problem, you went. And, um, and you didn't back away, even if you were good and scared. And Trump says, don't be afraid of the coronavirus. 
you know, you're always nervous, but you do your best to protect yourself. Um, and you, you do have twinges of fear when you do this kind of thing. CDC, about half our EIS officers were assigned to states and about half stayed in-house. My son is a now a CDC employee, but when, or a doctor, but when he was uh, doing his EIS, he was in special pathogens and did some amazing investigations. But I was assigned to New York State, which suited me just fine. And I, I just loved it. New York was the biggest state back in 1975, believe it or not, about 18 million people and had lots of history. And so as you look at that map, the uh, counties, and I did an epidemic investigation in every single county you see it in that map. We're doing two or three a day. Within a few months, I had, they reallocated about 40 staff to me and I was just running concurrent investigations and just having the time of my life. Uh, one day we got a call about there's an island out be, um, between that fork at the end of Long Island, and the dog catcher on Shelter Island had developed malaria. Well, you know, it's summertime, but in the United States, we worry about um, ordinary people getting a ma malaria, and he had no travel history that we knew of. And But more interestingly enough, um, Shelter Island was where the vacation and primary family home was of Governor Hugh Carey. And we get this call. The governor's worried about the dog catcher getting malaria, and within a few hours, we were on the governor's private jet being taken to uh, the end of uh, Long Island to investigate the dog catcher. Well, it's sort of an interesting history. He had been an Italian in the Italian army, and there is malaria in Italy, and he had a splenectomy, and he had the kind of particles inside his red cells that looked like malaria. But after further investigation, discovered that it was something called babesiosis, a different tick-borne disease, which was thought to be quite rare back then. By the way, it was the same time that we were discovering Lyme disease, just the other side of the Long Island Sound. And so whole transformation, a brand new set of diseases appeared, um, including in the governor's backyard during that time. Um, I, also during that time, some really wild uh, infection. The first epidemic investigation I did of all was a summer camp where the kids, probably 15, 20 of the kids, including the counselors, had aseptic meningitis and was down in the Catskills. And I went down and I was a skinny red-haired person that looked about 18. And I said to the camp owner, uh, we're doing an investigation. You got to let me in. And he said, no, I, there's nothing going on here. Go away. And I will tell you that how often somebody that has a vested interest tells you to go away. It happened every single time. And so um, I finally said, OK, I'm going to call the state police. And he, of course, let me in. We did a survey of the kids. It turned out they were forcing the kids to work in the in the dining room and the galleys and the food preparation and cleanup areas. The counselors, when they were sick. And so we shut them down. But I had to learn that you had to play hardball a fair amount of the time. A few months later, I get a call. It's now the fall. And uh, there had been an epidemic of appendectomies. And there were five hospitals sharing the Rome, New York, Utica, New York area. And so, you know, not all 10 kids showed up at the same hospital. So it look, took a little while to figure out what was going on. And... What was really interesting is they didn't have normal inflamed appendixes, appendices. They had sort of what we call mesenteric adenitis, which is just inflammation of the glands. The largest, by the way, um, immunologic gland in your body is your intestine. It's just loaded with uh, lymphocytes and B cells, T cells to um, fight illness because, you know, that's your... Uh, interface, your internal face to the external world. Um, and so bacterial infections can get in there and the glands in the intestine had really swollen up. And one of the pathologists or surgeons described looking at the intestinal wall and the, the lymphoid glands in there were so swollen um, and it looked like they had measles. And so it was originally thought it was mesenteric adenitis, but a smart lab person identified a quite a rare, extremely rare bacterium that was known to cause pseudomeningitis, and it was called Yersinia enterocolitica. Well, my big point about here is, you know, what is the partnership between 
physicians and public health, public health really needs alert clinicians. That's how we discovered a, the linamide. That's how we discovered childhood lead poisoning over and over again. It's the alert clinician um, raising hell about what's going on. And you know about the alert clinician in Wuhan, China. I think he was an ophthalmologist who uh, pointed out that there was a very unusual set of infections going there. This is, one of, this is my academic slides rather than a story, but epidemics are urgent natural experiments. And I'd like you, let's think about that for a minute. You could never inoculate somebody with radium. Uh, you could never inoculate, well, I, there is an inoculation going on with coronavirus in England. It just started this morning and they got permission to give people small doses and at the same time they were using uh, various vaccines. But in general, it's and it's very difficult to do studies. You know, you wouldn't be able to do a study depriving somebody of essential vitamins at this point because it would be unethical. So you have to get out and you have to get the ground truth of what's going on. So you can't say, I'll come back in a month or it'll go away by magic. You have to get feet on the ground, just like we did with Ebola in Central Africa. And you have to figure out what's going on in the environment. What's going on with the personnel? Is the water polluted? Is the, are the food polluted? Uh, the systems, is there a cross connection? When I was at CDC, we oversaw the, the cruise ships and there were big problems with both the galleys and well, we fixed it over time. But with the galleys and with, they would bunker in water when they were traveling to islands and sometimes somebody would hook up the uh, water pipe to the sewer pipe and you can imagine what that caused. Time is urgent because uh, for two reasons, if you want specimens, you've got to get out there fast because the virus or the bacterium will disappear. Um, and, and this is true, you get much better cooperation from people when they're scared to death. And I know that sounds cynical, but if you wait around till everybody uh, builds higher and higher levels of anxiety, um, you have trouble. I'll, I'll tell you one story. I, every epidemic investigation, you need to collect controls. And by that, I mean, you have to find the people who are sick and then you have to find people who are well. But if you're doing a lab test and trying to take blood from people who are well and trying to get a stool specimen or a rectal swab for people who are well, um, who are not sick, it's much harder. So the urgency makes it easier. The other thing that was hard is the hospitals don't want any part of government showing up and saying, we want to go through all the records of everybody that's sick and we want records to go through all the records of people that are age and gender matched to look for where they lived. And that's exactly what we did. And we found that, yes, there was a hot spot. Yes, it was Sir Yersinia. Yes, it wasn't just two and um, two randomly. It was a couple dozen uh, across multiple hospitals. And you really have to collect a lot of specimens and good labs. And New York State had a terrific lab. In fact, they're the ones that discovered nystatin, the antifungal. And you've all heard of that one. Nystatin comes from NY State because, and they had the revenue from that slide. So another reason, that, but a very strong history. They were the ones that diagnosed the babesiosis and from Shelter Island. Um, and, we, you know, I was doing closing schools for measles and, and other such things. So it was quite a, a vivid time. Um, I also learned, by the way, and I imposed this on my epidemiologist when I was at CDC, I want a lab person going on every epidemic investigation. And I said, oh, why do we need that lab person? Well, it turned out that epidemiologists learned a lot from the lab people. And the lab people learned how damn hard it was to get specimens from people when you're in the field. And, and people are suspicious and uh, you've got to maintain the cold chain. It's very hard work to do that lab work. You've got to ask the right questions, which is why you're in the field. And, and pretty quickly I thought, well, it's probably the water because that was in the past studies, the water had caused these infections and the Yersinia outbreaks. But in this case, it was kind of odd. It wasn't appearing where we thought. Um, so you come up with a case definition and epidemiologists argue forever. But for example, with COVID, uh, the case definition might have been uh, unexplained fever and, and but pretty soon you add unexplained fever and perhaps peeling toes and uh, second onset of respiratory uh, depression. Um, and so the case definition has to change over time, but you have to be honest about it because you don't want to be doing Texas sharpshooting. And this is a real, Texas sharpshooting is a joke term, but what it means is um, the, the bullseye is on the wall of the barn and the guy goes out with his revolver and uh, shoots the bullseye and completely misses. And so he goes, 
goes over and uh, draws a big bullseye around where he shot. And if you are not consistent and rigorous about how you define a case, uh, you can really get in a lot of trouble and you can end up with really unsatisfactory results. By the way, Kelly Burke says she doesn't trust anything from CDC. Uh, I think she should be ashamed of herself. The quality of the people there, in my experience, was spectacular. It had a 80%, 80% approval two years ago by the American people, as high as NASA and um, uh, the Weather Service and others. And the other reason you do these, and it's not merely that, um, you know, people, oh, you're just doing research, but you want to learn how do we prevent this from happening again? Beautiful little town, a couple thousand people, uh, the town square and the churches um, were lovely. I got out, it was upstate New York, so by this time of year, it was already snow on the ground now and then, at least back then, now with global warming, probably not. And um, it was my first real experience with total immersion with the media. There are now 32 kids that are hospitalized. And um, a story ran in the New York Times and John Chancellor News sent a TV crew up and there were probably six or eight TV crews after a while and lots and lots of reporters. And I had to learn about when you deal with a reporter, you tell the truth. Um, you say, I don't know when you don't know the answer. Um, and, but you don't go out of your way to say too much because you're going to probably have to retract. Back then, with no computers, we had to devise questionnaires, and that had to come from actually meeting people and asking, you know, what have you done? Did you go to the football game? Did you drink the ices? Did you eat the hot dogs? Uh, where did you buy? Where do you buy your food? The school, the food at school was mainly USDA stuff that came in big cans, and it didn't really pan out. But very oddly, we discovered from the questionnaires that kids who drank chocolate milk were getting sicker than the kids who drank white milk. And so, and literally, we're barely sleeping. It's about the third or fourth day. Uh, I and Bob Black go out to the dairy where the cows were being milked, and we said to the farmer, um, you know, how do you, how do you milk it? He took us into the barn and he showed us uh, how we, they milked the cows. They collected the milk. They put the milk in that great big vat you're looking at. Uh, this is the raw milk. And it was pasteurized by the time it went into the vat. And then I said, well, how do you make your chocolate milk? And he goes, oh, you see that milk can over on the left? Well, um, we, uh, I just get a big can of chocolate syrup and I take this stirring rod off the wall in the barn and I pour the pasteurized milk in there, and then I take the chocolate syrup and pour it in and mix it all up. Well, that research, you should not enter pasteurized milk with a foreign instrument at that point. It needs to stay sealed all the way through. Well, to make a long story short, one of the things we learned is there was no better culture medium for Yersinia enterocolitica than a sugary solution at the pH of milk and kept cold because it killed all the other bacteria and your city I love to grow in the cold. So it was amazing. We uh, asked the farmer, he was a gentleman. I, I said, please stop um, selling your milk. And I, we could have insisted, but he says, no, of course I will not sell it. I, I don't want to make anybody sick. And um, we went back and I had the experience of going to, I had no lab data because this bug was very slow growing. Uh, but we had questionnaire data from both the sick kids and compared with well kids, and then an interview survey from all the thousand kids in the schools, um, and they all showed up chocolate milk. It was a very strong epidemic. Um, I go back to the health department, I walk in a room, and I had been bushwhacked, and there were probably, again, about 30 reporters and five TV cameras in the room, and the... Uh, one of the most aggressive, unpleasant reporters came up to me on camera and uh, stuck a microphone in my face. He says, all right, Dr. Jackson, you said it was the dairy. Now, where did that, where did that milk come from? And I, I didn't know what to answer. I didn't know my liability. I didn't know anything. I said, well, uh, 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 cows. Well, that was the only thing on NBC Network News about this whole epidemic that night. I, I got in a little trouble with the dairy industry, but we eventually got proof from the lab samples that we sent to CDC and to um, uh, Albany, New York laboratories. Um, it actually panned out that the um, organism that was in the milk, the chocolate milk, was the same organism that was in the children. 
So the lawsuit was eventually dropped when the gun literally was almost smoking in that situation. Here's the New England Journal of Medicine article uh, that we wrote on it. And so where I'm going with that is the partnership with the clinicians, the partnership with the public health infrastructure out there, the workers, you need people to go out and collect all those samples. The TB investigators and STD investigators were essential. I was not trained to deal with um, the media. I had to learn on the fly and um, much of my career has been this sort of thing. Around that same time, an old uh, ditch that was being was built for the Erie Canal was filled with toxic chemicals produced by Hooker Chemical, and that of course became Love Canal. And so there was more and more environmental stuff rearing. The United States was looking at developing a super, well, not by then, but realizing that there were many, many toxic sites around the country. I think around then the Cayuga River had caught fire and environment had really become very important. Well, it's now December and my California bride is getting used to upstate New York winters and CDC calls me and says, Dick, we want you to go to Bihar State in India and work on smallpox eradication. And so um, uh, they shift, ship me a set of um, airline tickets and the thing looked like a deck of cards because there were so many connections to get to where I was going first across Europe and to Delhi and then out to Bihar and Calcutta and the rest. And I was thrilled because I wanted to do overseas experience and um, so, and my wife came over towards the end, we stayed a couple extra weeks there. But um, smallpox is, is frightening. Um, I, I won't, you know, the, what they had there had about a seven or eight percent mortality, it was very ill and minor, very ill and major had a 50 percent mortality. And the vaccine really did work. By the way, Bill Fagey was the lead of all that. And Bill Fagey was the man that wrote the letter to the current head of CDC saying, if you wanted to deal with this disease, you had to do what we did with smallpox, which is search and contain. You don't just go for herd immunity. Herd immunity had, didn't work for 50 years in the United States for smallpox. We had to do search and contain. So um, this failure to really take it seriously has been a terrible problem. This is where I was assigned. And um, during the uh, discussion around climate change, I talked about my shock at seeing the Ganges River and the Brahmaputra River um, going in the, the Bay of Bengal and how low the Gangetic Plain is and how easily uh, sea level rise and inundation will um, really bring about starvation in those areas. The sea water will destroy many of the crops and with the end of the Himalayan ice sheets, and they're melting very, very rapidly, it means that those rivers may not flow for long periods. And I think California is looking at the same thing. And we, Robin talked about uh, Colorado confronting the same thing. And by the way, half of all the water in Los Angeles comes from the Colorado River. So the smallpox experience was really profound. I spent months looking for cases I would like to say I found one. I found one that looked like it. I sent samples off, but it was not smallpox. I had gotten there, but it was important because we had to document that smallpox was gone. And I want to tell you outright that this was the United States government and CDC and the CD, uh, NI, National CD, uh, Health, um, Health and Human Services supporting WHO to do this because it was done under the aegis of WHO but it was really our funding that did this. And unilateralism is crazy. We So many of the threats we face require multilateralism. As I said, environment had become more and more important. Uh, right then was the very first study of children being exposed to chemicals and um, the wild study about, uh, some of you are probably old enough to remember when Fisahex was used um, if you had a dirty infection, well, baby, babies were being bathed with Fisahex until it was discovered it caused lacunae, you know, basically bubbles in the brain of, of uh, rhesus monkeys, and that's when we banned it. But over and over again, we were discovering what we were doing to children, and you know the story of uh, DES, diethylstorestrol, early life experiences, you can carry them on forever. Children are not little adults, and so many of the regulatory decisions they said if we protect a 70 kilogram man, a grown man laying on the couch watching the Super Bowl, that's enough. Well, kids breathe two or three times as much as adults. They drink uh, and eat three or four times as much as adults. 
and they have three times the skin area than an adult does for pound of body weight, well, as far for pound of body weight. So we really need to set the standards to protect the most vulnerable and the most heavily exposed in the population. So at that point, I realized that I could not go back and do pediatrics. I had really had such an intense time with CDC. I went did my year, but did not go into an infectious disease residency. I went over to, and by the way, Jersey was weighing on my uh, mind as well. I went over to Berkeley and got my master's in public health and epidemiology, because I really is a pretty unsophisticated epidemiologist. Still am, really, compared to what they've got now. And the state health department was right there in Berkeley across the street. So I started work at the California Department of Health Services, and I was assigned to do pesticide work. I was thrilled because that was what I was interested in from the start. We had 300,000 farm workers in California and really being exposed. I'll skip this one because I know I'm running out of time. A billion pounds of pesticides, 25% of the U.S. total. I think I said 50%, but I, and I apologize. Um, look at this picture of them spraying paraquat on a cotton field and the flagger trying to move out of the way. And the crop duster pilot uh, probably trying to turn off his nozzles and trying not to hit those poles or high voltage wires. Uh, it's quite, it's a big industrial site out there, even though it's called agriculture. I, re I learned very quickly that the people most heavily exposed, and people always ask, well, I'm worried about eating this or that. Farm workers are getting about a thousand times as much chemical in a day. You're working in the hot sun, often with exposed skin. Um, there are chemical residues on the plants. Here's a man picking oranges and developed a burn from the chemicals were being used. And we saw much of this. They were very hard to investigate. We were doing maybe 10, 12 cluster investigations during the summer, and they were very hard. The farm workers didn't want to talk to an, you know, a guy from the government who didn't speak decent Spanish. Um, so getting trust, and by the way, it was just as hard to get trust from the growers. They just said, go away. And they were very politically powerful. The toxicology data was lousy. Half of it was false. Um, there was no ability to really calculate residues in people and, and do that. And uh, there was no reporting of how much was being used. And so there's another big takeaway is that public health is, in essence, political. I got a call in 1984 by the head neonatologist, a friend in the intensive care nur a baby nursery in UCLA, and she said, I have a baby here who was born with tetramelia, and the mother was poisoned about the 30th day of her pregnancy. Could you go investigate? And, of course, we did go investigate, and she was poisoned, but she didn't know. There was brown powder and yellow powder, and she threw up and had headaches and felt bad. The grower didn't have any record of what they were doing um, and really didn't want to cooperate anyway, and it was heartbreaking and this baby actually was uh, appeared when we were pushing for legislation to fix this. One piece of legislation was we put in place, and this took three to four years of work of, make, of breezing through this, but we put in place a California birth defects monitoring program, which has been used for much more than just looking at pesticides. It looks at vitamins, cerebral palsy, treatments like uh, drugs that are used for eclampsia and other such things. And of course, neural tube de defects and gastroschisis. But around then, we had a, a series of pretty severe cancer clusters in McFarland and Rosamond, California, all children, and pulled together um, an advisory committee. And um, we had faculty from UC Berkeley, from Stanford, from local doctors down there, and asked. We didn't prove that the cancer cluster was due to the pesticides, although everybody was sure it was. But the committee recommended, and we eventually got the authority to demand that all pesticide use be recorded. That sounds, well, that's boring. Well, no. Every farmer knows exactly what they're using and when they're using it, and they have to keep records, and they have to turn them into the Department of Agriculture. It's electronic, and it's using computers. It wasn't that difficult. It's turned out to be a gold mine for people looking even at Parkinson's and many other diseases at this point. And by the way, still, California is the only state that requires mandatory reporting of all agricultural pesticide use. And it's not only a research um, gold mine, it's actually helped the farmers because it turned out 
a lot of cases, they didn't really need all of it. Um, some of you may be old enough to remember the 60 Minutes show about A is for Apple and LR in uh, Apples. And uh, But there was other things going on that we, the pediatricians, the Academy of Pediatrics has been magnificent. And, um, uh, you know, I love them. And in general, the public loves them and the elected officials trust them. And so uh, they agitated and uh, members of Congress, including Nancy Pelosi, demanded that the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine, used to be called ILM, Institute of Medicine, do a report on pesticides in the diets of infants and children. It came out in 1993, and it led to the only environmental law during the entire Clinton administration, the Food Quality Protection Act. And what that said, and did you notice the partnership between public health and between the and with the clinicians? What it said was, you no longer can set food residue limits, they're called tolerances, but it doesn't matter, on simply the basis of um, a couch potato, old man's watch, a guy like me watching TV, it has to be set on the basis of children. It has to reflect what they eat and how much they eat. And by the way, you're gonna put in an extra tenfold safety factor on those residues. And so the, a lot of them had, apples had like 10 parts per million, they had to drop to half a part per million of tolerances. And if you have even 10 apples in the entire boxcar that exceed those tolerances, they condemn the whole boxcar. So it really got the grower's attention. And this sounds kind of crazy, but there's a medical issue. About 25 of the chemicals have the same, they're in the same toxicologic group. Um, malathion is in the same group as parathion. Malathion is very weak. Parathion is a thousand times more strong. Altacarb is equally as strong. Nerve gas is only about 10 times more strong than, and the same chemical pathway, by the way, as the, the most, most powerful ones. You can't give out, you can't put 10 different chemicals that have the same effect on a food and say, well, they're all legal limits. It'd be like giving 10 different narcotics at lower doses. You're asking for trouble. Um, so, and I was friends with Marion Moses, and Marion was Cesar Chavez's uh, pr primary physician. She is a wonderful woman. She just passed away about a month ago. And Marion would give me a hard time and say, Dick, you're doing trickle-down public health. I'm there caring for the farm workers. And I have to say that when we dropped the tolerances, so about two-thirds of the chemical, chemicals were removed from the market or removed for spe from specific uses. But by t dropping the tolerances, the legal limits so much, the, the growers were wanted to be scrupulous about not having too much in there because they didn't want to face condemnation of their crops. It meant that the no longer were war farm workers being sent into fields with um, where they could still be hot, and the number of large-scale pesticide poisonings went away. I went to CDC in, in 1994. I was recruited back to be the head of the National Center for Environmental Health. Uh, it had about 500 CDC employees and about 500 contractors. It had a world-class laboratory looking at toxic substances, but it was still inadequate. It did cancer epidemiology, birth defects epidemiology, lead poisoning, childhood lead poisoning, um, and uh, regulated the cruise ships and the safety of cruise ships. Uh, destruction of the U.S. chemical weapons, which is a whole other story. And by the way, knowing about pesticides was very useful because I had to learn about that and a series of other things. I was sworn in by um, one of my heroes, Dr. David Satcher, who eventually became Surgeon General. And, you know, you think about, I'm going to preserve and protect the Constitution, the people of the United States. And it's all right there in the preamble. Your job is not, it's not about you. And they went over my financial background. I, you know, I had a 401k from California. They wanted to know what was in some of my, you know, mutual funds that I was owning. They, they were very scrupulous. So it's shocking to me that people can get into high level government jobs without that kind of scrutiny, um, at least if they're in the administration. Um, and I began to push the laboratory to figure out how to measure chemicals in people. And I want to recognize Nancy, um, Congresswoman Pelosi, uh, she was the one that got us the $40 million a year to improve the laboratories, improve the methods. Recruiting is very hard in the, that kind of laboratory world unless you have very good facilities. When we got the good facilities, we were able to measure lots more chemicals. And you'll hear from Gina Solomon about BEHP and bisphenol A and a bunch of other chemicals and even tobacco smoke byproducts. 
that all came out of the CDC laboratories in and in some ways, it went right back to the experience of trying to figure out what was in farm workers. Uh, a quick story was you see that word phthalates in there, and you'll hear about that from Gina. But one of the, when they came in with the data that showed phthalate levels in the U.S. population, women of childbearing age had much, much, much higher levels than anybody else in the population. And these chemicals are weak carcinogens and weak estrogens. And I said, that's really strange. And they said, yeah, you know, that lipstick is 50% phthalates. And it's really unbelievable. And by the way, baby uh, chew toys were about 50% phthalates as well. So finding the chemicals in people had huge inflection and drive for the chemicals that were in the population. I also had the Refugee and International Health Group um, learned a lot about what happens when huge populations have to move. And we were charged with setting up the multi-billion dollar national pharmaceutical stockpile. Um, and you see that picture at the bottom right. Those uh, containers my staff had to design and they were designed to fit uh, the rounded ones into an aircraft. And we had four 747s under contract that could be loaded up and flown anywhere. This is the late 90s. This is not until what I'm going to show you next, which is on September 11th. Uh, the only civilian aircraft in the United States, you know, count Air Force One as civilian, um, was the CDC staff on that afternoon flying up to Manhattan and to um, uh, the Pentagon to look at it. We weren't so much there. We weren't there to give care. We were there because we were very worried about a second punch. We were worried about toxic things on the aircraft or even radiation or something else. So we would have epidemiologists really monitoring the emergency rooms. And of course, you know about anthrax appearing not long after that. I was never bored. And the good news was, I think we learned a lot. To, frankly, the bad news was an awful lot was transferred to Homeland Security, which is very thin on its scientific depth, in my opinion. After that, um, I left CDC in 2004 and Governor Schwarzenegger brought me in to be the state health officer. I did that for about a year and a half. Um, my wife always jokes about me in that picture. She said, because I look like his secret service man trying to guard Governor Schwarzenegger. But I actually appreciated the man and he was very serious about his concerns about climate change. And he still is. He endowed a large program at USC. I don't know how he did that. Should have been at UCLA um, to deal with climate. So I'm going to close with a couple comments on uh, climate. The National Institutes of Health has a budget and corrected, you know, for inflation dollars, averaging about 60 billion with a B dollars per year. They've had that for about 15 years. That's $600 billion over 15 years. So in preparation for this event that we did yesterday in um, in Washington, D.C. It was, we did it remotely. Bill Gates came on and talked about the important juncture between COVID. And this is what your course is about and the climate. And uh, the first presentation was um, we had Dr. Fauci and we gave him the highest award from the National Academy of Medicine. And uh, I will send you the wonderful encomium that was given about what a magnificent man he was, uh, has been in his leadership. And that went on for a couple hours. And then I was able to moderate and run a session with the head of environmental health for Europe, in essence, um, with these other folks. And then a junction of um, really policy experts, including the former head of the uh, Kim, uh, Jim Young Kim, former head of the World Bank, Donna Shalala, former head of HHS, and very astute person, and Niall Ferguson from Stanford. He was uh, from the Hoover Institution um, and a number of other people. Judith Roden, former head of the Rockefeller Foundation, put out $100 million for this sort of thing. So it was really um, impressive that a bunch of docs finally figured out, look, we got to deal with this. This is on our plate. So I won't go too deep into climate, but remember I showed you the moon walk back in July of 1969, back when I was starting medical school. And here we are. Um, of the 50th anniversary and the first all-woman spacewalk, and there are twice as many people on the planet. And uh, the Earth's atmosphere now has 90 parts per million. And back 
40 years ago, people were saying if we exceed 350 parts per million, we're going to raise the temperature by almost one degree Celsius. And we're now about one and a half degrees Celsius up. The scientists that were predicting global warming have been right about almost everything except for one thing. It is happening so much faster than anyone ever predicted. And um, I was saying yesterday that, you know, I think in my time living in California, the temperature in the Bay Area has gotten much more like Los Angeles, not right near the beach, but inland. And Los Angeles has become much more like Ensenada and Baja, California. So, um, and it's pretty much what they were predicting. And the loss of the snow cap in the Sierra will be a disaster because snow is is worth its it's really money up there because you don't have to build lots of uh, reservoirs. It's the it's melts slowly and seeps into the mountain, and then you've got a a base flow coming down of all those creeks and rivers all summer long. But if we, it's just rain, it flows down with plenty of mud in it. It's going to be much more expensive. The hottest five years ever recorded were 15 to 19, and 20 will be probably even hotter. Um, you see that blue dot up below Greenland? So these are the places where the water, where the air and the water got colder. It's very odd. It got colder near the edges of Antarctica, and it got colder below Greenland. What's going on there? With the melting of the Greenland ice cap, the water is pouring down in the Moulins and all the way down to the bedrock and then flowing out to sea and pushing lots more ice and going out. And the quantity of water coming off Greenland now is 281 gigatons per year. And by the way, these are, I should put two N's in the gigaton because um, a T-O-N-N-E is one cubic meter of water and it weighs a thousand kilograms. So a gigaton is a billion of those. So you want to get a visual view. And by the way, 281 gigatons of water that has been pure ice for 200,000 years is pouring into the North Atlantic. And that's what three gigatons look like. So imagine that much water. It's far more than it's coming off the Hudson. I don't know if it's as much as comes off the Mississippi. But the ice melt is so rapid and so profound that it's turning the ocean up there much colder as this brilliantly clear, clear uh, fresh water is disappearing from Greenland. So the fires, uh, you know, I was preparing a separate lecture on the fires I was doing it for UCSD. And I did this screenshot. And you, of course, you know where we are. And that's around November 8th. And, I'm sorry, September 8th. And you can see the heavy smoke off the coast of California. But I, as I backed out and backed out, I suddenly realized that the smoke was going all the way across and to Scotland and, and Northern Europe. It eventually reached Siberia, and a lot of it, that brown black carbon ended up on Greenland as well. And if you want to make ice melt faster, you just pour black soot on it in the sun because it will really accelerate the melting. So final, and there'll be a quiz now and a little story to go with this one. So I was Governor Schwarzenegger's health officer, and I had to do an AM radio show in Sacramento one day. You know, they just tell you, no, you got to go talk to that guy. So I went over at 8 o'clock in the morning, and this rather large, red-faced, tobacco-smelling, rather aggressive man uh, said, ah, oh, yeah, you're a doctor. You came, you work for Schwarzenegger, but you're a government employee. You must be either corrupt, stupid, or lazy. That was not the warmest greeting I'd ever gotten in my life, and I... Uh, said, well, I'm not corrupt. I try and be very honest. I don't lie because I don't tell people everything I know because that can be a real problem, but I don't lie. Um, stupid, yes, I'm a doc, and I feel at the edge of my knowledge a lot of the time, and every good physician very quickly has to learn what they don't know and when they need to call for help. Um, but I'm not lazy. I work very hard. But, sir, you don't realize is the purpose of public health is not to create the nanny state. I'm not going to try and force you to wear a seatbelt or stop smoking. But the purpose of public health is that society's got an interest in making sure there are conditions where people are healthy. And you can't be healthy if the guy next to you on the plane is smoking. And you can't be healthy if the only food you can afford is um, 
highly processed sugar laden, sugar, fat and salt laden food. And we spend our career and I spent my time trying to give people the conditions where it's easier, where they can be healthy. And it's really an empowerment effort. And he didn't accept that, but he wasn't quite as rude after that. So um, that's the end of it. I, the three uh, books here are um, books that I've done around urban planning because telling people about climate change when you live in the South is very, very hard. But telling people they ought to live in communities where they can walk, bike, have plenty of trees, lots of parks, have quality density and net zero buildings, uh, they don't argue about that as much. And I did a PBS series for four hours on this, and it's the lower right um, picture there, Designing Healthy Communities, which, by the way, you can actually watch it now on Canopy, which I'm pretty sure U.S. UCSF um, would have the contract. My Berkeley um, library, um, you can just tune it in, and uh, I'll send, if folks are interested, I'll send you the link. Um, I find that middle school and high school kids like it best because they're very worried about the world and it has solutions for them um, about how they can redesign their own little world. I don't mean little, but, you know, they're, the, the world they're in, immersed in and as they should be. So with that, I'm going to stop and, and thank you for your attention, even though you may be all sound asleep. I can't tell. Well, I have to say I am not sound asleep. Um, I... Um have been riveted kind of by your, um, your, your storytelling and your life story, which I think links a number of really important things that I took from the conversation. And while I'm going to blab on for just a minute or so, I hope people will populate the question and answer, um, the question and answer uh, area. But I wanted what I took from much of what you're saying is in order, I love this ending, public health is to fulfill society's interest in, a, in assuring conditions in which people can be healthy. And I think that that's a, a really, thank you for ending with that. What I took from it is in order to be the kind of health investigator that you are and that you have demonstrated and that public health is, one has to be kind of a, de a detective. And you start with something that is seen, you said the clinician and you talked about spina bifida and spina bifida is what was noticed, just like the noticing of the snow, snow melt. And then Dick, what I heard you do was, was put was just being curious that there has to be a curiosity and an inquiry why is this happening you have to take a wider lens and put on that curiosity hat Matt. you also talked about needing resources and that seemed to have to do with a lot to do with funding and support you talked about a multiplicity of people who come together starting from scratching your head about that curiosity, where does this come from, but then people actually out directly in the field and, and noticing the way real things are done in the world. Noticing, oh, that's where the chocolate milk is. Someone has to th then have the curiosity to say, well, how, how is your chocolate milk made? Really simple things, but noticing the details and then bringing those back to a broader understanding. You talked about clusters, of course, that we know about. Then one of the things that I think you added was um, if you are really going to assure the conditions in which people can live healthy lives, you have to be willing to challenge vested interests. And that seemed really important to me. You then talked about that, there, that it seemed to me in challenging public vested interests, you're talking about and you later said, these things have to be translated into policies. And policies inevitably engage politicians. So it is political. You also talked, although you didn't give a lot of discussion about it, about a regulatory environment. 
and kind of a willingness to accept a regulatory environment. I'm going to start to read some of the questions, but I would, but as I do that and coordinate these, maybe you can just um, talk a little bit about some of the current threats to regulations that we're experiencing, both around COVID, but also around climate. Boy, you're very provocative, um, and, and thank you so much, Robin. Number one, the assure the conditions. I probably sh that definition comes from the Institute of Medicine, and it is powerful. And I'm not joking. I put that in every exam I gave, and I said, if you don't get this right, I, I'm <laughs> you're going to lose thirty points. I made it, and you, you it looks sort of plebeian and pedestrian, but it will bail you out as you're. People are saying, why are you bothering me? Like the guy running a summer camp saying, go away. And oftentimes we public people, you know, we're trying to tell people to tax sugar sweetened beverages, to tax fossil fuels, to um, really change a lot of the things we're doing, to vision zero about car crashes. And you can imagine guns and nicotine are... Uh, number two, you got to have the resources and you're not going to get them you need to have, and this is, this sounds simple as could be. I said it took about six years, seven years to do all that pesticide work. I had to really buffer my language. In the beginning, I went in talking about carcinogens and teratogens and everything else. I got nowhere. I had to begin to say, we've got to fill the data gaps because everybody understood it. And you don't get, you don't figure that one out in the beginning. You have to get banged around to, to learn that. Um, I have to, and the Academy of Pediatrics has just been magnificent. And um, increasingly, the medical establishment, including psychiatry, is really coming along on um, climate. I tell a quick story of living in Atlanta, and the boys are in high school, and they, we have three sons, and um, they wanted a, of course, we wanted them to have summer jobs. It's important. And one of them said, oh, you know, they wanted me to be a salesman. And I want to be a salesman. And I said, well, you know what? Everybody's a salesman. And every time I, I went to Washington, D.C. once a week and I was selling CDC, I was selling my programs and really thinking about what are the things that resonate with individual elected officials, with organizations. And um, you you don't get good at this unless you do it. It's like everything else in, in medicine or everything else. Uh, and there always are vested interests. I want to act... Uh go on to one of our anonymous uh, the questions uh -oh. um, around vested interests. Uh, specifically, how do you see the future given the ongoing tug of war between those focused on business and commerce, capitalism, and those trying to heal the planet? COVID-19 has laid that dilemma so starkly at our feet. And that, I will add, so has climate change. Um, and I have a few questions that I do want to get to, but I, that tug of war between business and commerce and healing the planet. Howie Frumkin, who's one of the, is the co-author on two of those books, and I are agitating to establish a new institute at NIH and to fund it at the range of about a billion dollars, because we need to have a pipeline of smart young docs coming up and all of climate stuff right now is done as sort of a hidden vice. You know, I got funding to do, you know, depression in America, but I want to look at climate uh, while I'm doing it. But we don't have a direct funding. And to get young people to really work on it, the young people are passionate about this, much more passionate than, that's why it was such a big deal to get the Geriatric National Academy of Medicine to begin to care about this. And I'm very close to the Jesuits near here. I live in Berkeley near Holy Hill. And, um, not terribly religious anymore in my life, but I, they're having the same problem getting their hierarchy to move. They're extremely conservative and uh, doing that. I think you just have to keep at it. And what my own experience is, is once, like we put the full reporting of pesticide use in California, it was going to be the end of the world. All the growers are going to go broke and blah, blah, blah. As soon as it's put in place, the next thing you know, everybody's taking credit for it. Oh, it's the best thing we ever did. We're really proud of it. And so... Um, I, and I, you know, we were, I've been agitating for a, the Los Angeles uh, River. Um, that should be a 50 mile uh, walk bike route through, and it goes through the poorest, most obese um, 
hottest parts of, of Los Angeles, if we turn that into an esplanade like the American River in Sacramento, poor people could use it to get to work downtown. Um, children might see egrets and other birds. Um, somebody might even go fishing. Um, and it's going to have to rip out a lot of concrete. But 50 years from now, people will say, oh, that was my idea all along. I was behind the conversion of that concrete sluice into that beautiful uh, place that it is now. So you just have to you have to stay at it. And as the chewing gum industry and the cigarette industry, Coca-Cola and Pepsi learned, you know, they spend $70,000 a second during the Super Bowl to tell people to drink crappy stuff. So, you know, you just got to repeat the messages. So we have another question from someone. Um, uh, and then two on career development. But um, how can... Um, uh, this has to do with tack, I suppose, or when you start to get uh, pushback. Help us understand the tightrope walk Dr. Fauci has been on with the administration. Some of us have grown frustrated he has not been more aggressive. And I suppose, Dick, having to face the political tug of wars in your career, you might have something to, some reflection on Poor Dr. Fauci's tightrope walk. You know, he's amazing. He just um, goes along. Um, he's been doing this for a long time. He's been in that job for over 35 years. And he was dealing with HIV AIDS, which is at least as tough. Um, and people were accusing the government of covering it up. But in fact, we didn't have good lab methods. And it took a long time to get the treatment put in place. And he kept saying it's about good science. Tony... Um, you know, this is an odd thing to say, and that's why I talked about the Jesuits a little bit. You got to know who you are on the inside, and you have to put up with a lot when you're in these jobs. You don't mouth off at everything you don't like, and, but you you sort of have to go along with things, and you have to pick your battles very, very carefully. NIH was much better off, and the nation is much better off, that Tony kept the job and kept his mouth shut, and I'm sure in the back room he was probably pushing very hard. Um, and you know, in those jobs, they tell you not to talk to the press, but you, you're going out the back door and talking to the press all the time. Um, and you can get burned with that, but you, you have to do it. Um, so, uh, one of the things that got me to leave the seminary seminary was the, uh, I fell in love with Henry David Thoreau's Walden and decided that I had become a pantheist and God was present in all of the universe. And, uh, uh, Thoreau had the great line, which was, the only thing I regret in my life is my good behavior. And uh, I tell that to the young people, you know, you can do what you want, just don't steal and, um, and be careful about it. And always assume that anything you do is going to be on the front page of the Washington Post. And be careful what you put in writing. Nowadays, what you put on the internet and Facebook. So I have one, another question, and then I'm going to pivot to some people who need career advice, um, or two questions. One from Do Donna Statton, um, and she says that fossil fuel infrastructure, the jobs versus the environment argument, is alive and well. How we deal with that contradiction. How, um, do you have suggestions for how to talk with organized labor? And I just want to makes me think of the interest group on climate change this last Sunday about that argument about it is economically, value, it is an economic gain for us to move toward a zero emission economy, but let you answer the question. You know, I probably will use those slides um, at the end of when I come back on December 8th. And, uh, but it, it's a dinosaur. Um, we're using dinosaur juice to make um, fuels and, uh, you know, fossil fuels, it, it doesn't make any sense any longer. Uh, coal is not viable compared to moving electricity. These um, wind turbines that are, you know, generating some of the 100,000 kilowatts. Um, and they this will be all across West Virginia is what... Uh, Pakala was saying, and I think, you know, you can give a lot of people a lot of jobs by putting in solar and putting in, in fact, many more jobs. And by the way, coal mining, these the trucks that they're using up in the, uh, up north of Cal, 
Calgary and these places. I'm trying to think of the name of it, but the, the tar sands, you know, you, you can move the equivalent of a whole city block in one of these trucks and with one guy driving it. It's not generating a lot of jobs. It's generating a lot of wealth somewhere at a distance and a lot of pollution because, by the way, the, the mixture is, uh, they call them bombs, some of the tank cars that are hauling this because there's such a mixture of volatile organics and, and gases going in them. So I, I think they're... The, the insurance industry is extremely worried, and as and the insurance, my friend who um, who passed away, uh, who did a lot of this work, uh, said the smartest people in capitalism are the people that run the reinsurance corporations, Zurich Re and Munich Re and the rest, and they are scared to death of the liabilities in the future, and once these big companies can't get, once our insurance companies, the smaller you know, you think of Aetna as a small insurance company, but compared to Swiss Re and Munich Re, they are very, they're small. Once they stop not getting reinsured, it's going to completely back off the investment in that. And America needs to bring back jobs. We, it is crazy that we lost so much of our manufacturing. It's one of the reasons it's so polluted now near the port of Los Angeles. You know, 30, 40 huge ships coming in a day. So, um, yeah, we need to create jobs it's not going to happen overnight. We're going to have to take care of people as we train them for those jobs. We're going to have to pay their salaries. We're going to have to support their families, help them pay their rent or mortgage during that. So I'm just going to let a few of the people who have asked several questions about the impacts of their, um, their activities, individual carbon footprint. That's Alyssa Eppel from uh, my buddy from the Department of Psychiatry. Um, and another, uh, and uh, Carol Child, who also has brought up questions about um, the most important things the government can do or individuals and communities can do. But I just want to let those people who have put those answers in, those questions in, that that's going to be what we're going to build to. And we hope to come out with answers on those types of questions in our last session. And Dick is going to be back as a panelist then, because I want to, to ask the last several questions specifically about um, younger um, people who are who are looking at their careers going forward. One is an undergraduate um, at UC Berkeley's and these two are both anonymous and he's asking or she um, how do you decide between a career between uh, graduate school and medical school interest in both environmental science, infectious disease, public health, um, or through graduate school or medical school, what's the difference? And then I have another um, a, a doctor who is working to pursue a career at NIH and climate change effects. And both of those I think are, you know, what wisdom can you bring to those who are interested in developing the career? And also, Dick, I have heard you say, how we need to develop a pipeline to help our our future leaders know how to do this. So I think that that will be the last we'll be able to to address tonight. And those other other questions that are so important are what we're going to build to in this uh, whole series. One is. Um... Boy, do I understand the dilemma between, you know, do I go to medical school? Do I go for a PhD? Um, you can tell that I've got attention deficit disorder. And medicine is a much better match for my personality. I'm, I like being with people. I, would, I hated being in laboratories. Um, and I hated being locked away writing long theses. So, um, you know, you have to look at your own uh, background, number one. Number two, and you're not going to like this one, you got to pick one thing and go deep when you're young. And that's why I told the pesticide story. I knew a lot about pesticides after seven, eight years doing it. It's more complicated than pharmacology, believe it or not. Um, there's so many brands and so many mixtures and it's, it's very, very hard to do it. Um, and that's why we needed them, the measurement of what's going on and we needed good toxicology. But once I had that, it, completely equipped me for the CDC job, all that chemical weapons stuff. And we did the study of the, you know, that man that was poisoned um, by, probably by Putin. Um, that was, this chemicals in the same family. You know, I knew all, you know, we know how to do this stuff. So 
I think you have to look at your own strengths and, and try and go deep early. Don't try and do everything later on because it will open the doors um, later on if you do that. Um, I, a quick comment. You know, I, I've been... That's why I mentioned Daisy Mitchell. Um, what a gift it's been in my life to become a physician and to work on something that's important. And I think the burden of losing my father, you know, made me kind of neurotic. You're the psychiatrist, but I mean, in the sense that I really wanted to do something important that, and it's, you know, they talk about Obama. There are a bunch of men who lost their fathers that um, it, it makes you more intense. And by the way, you have to have a very strong mother in that situation, which I did. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, I wasn't going to, I can't imagine going to law school and then defending um, Amazon from lawsuits from their employees or something like that. It just, you know, you want to make a contribution in your lives and I'm going to be 75 in a couple days. And um, you want to be able to look back and say, you know, I'm, I, I'm not smug, but I'm glad I did what I did. And medicine was a great gift. So I hate to put this, to have to draw this to an end, but I know many people have to leave and am thankful very much for your contribution, Dick, to the, the discussion tonight. Thank you so much and uh, keep up your great work, all of you. And thank you for the contribution you're making to UCSF and to the people of California and the country. Mm -hmm.